Hey, everyone. We're a bit early, just wanted to get the meeting started. So we'll give a, people a few minutes to start joining and then uh, we'll kick it off about three minutes after. So thanks, uh, thanks for choosing to spend your time with us today. We have people streaming in. I feel like it would be great to have some background music. <laughs> you want me to sing? Uh, we want people to stay on the call, AG. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, and we're just at, at 10 p.m. PST. So again, well, thanks for joining those who have joined. Uh, we're just going to hold off for maybe two or three more minutes while we're waiting for some other folks to uh, to come online, and then we'll dive right into it. We really do appreciate those who've decided to join so far. I know with uh, the past three or four months, joining webinars uh, has kind of become the new norm. So might be some webinar fatigue, but I think this will be a really great session with Jenna and Andrew from Go Cardless. All right, we're two minutes past the hour. So just another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll kick things off. And this will be recorded as well, so we'll be able to share it with uh, everyone who's registered. And of course, feel free to pass that along to your, uh, your friends and peers who couldn't make it. Just before we start, I want to give a big thanks to Alicia for helping pull this together. We've been excited uh, at the chance to do this. So I think now's about a good a good time as any to kick it off. So um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for choosing to spend your time with us for the next 35 minutes or so. Um, we'll be running through uh, a great dialogue between uh, Jenna Wire and AG and Andrew Gilboy from Go Cardless, Jenna's from Recurly, uh, on the topic of how to unlock subscription growth with flexible payment options. Um, just make sure that everything's recording and then we'll kick it off. Sound good, AG and Jenna? Sounds good, ready to go. Yeah. Looking right. forward to it. Perfect. So I'm just gonna, uh, to save my uh, connection here, I'm just gonna go off video and we'll kick it off. So. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, this webinar is presented by Recurly and Go Cardless on the topic of how to unlock subscription growth with flexible payment options. And and we are joined by Jenna Wire, uh, VP of uh, Business Development and Partnerships. She's been with Recurly for two and a half years and previously was a founding member of Braintree and also the head of growth at Spreedly. Um, Andrew Gilboy, or AG, as he goes by, has been with Go Cardless for just over three years. Uh, he was previously our CRO, uh, but moved to North America to become the GM uh, after we got investment from Salesforce and Google. Uh, so he's leading our team here over the past year. 
uh, and I am Michael Krantz. I'm the Senior Partner Manager at GoCardless, and I oversee the relationship between Recurly and GoCardless. Um, moving right along, uh, for the agenda for today, we're going to cover four different topics. Uh, and throughout the, uh, the session, if you do have any questions, I invite you to share them through the chat. At the end, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A. And for any questions that we don't get to, we'll be sure to follow up in a uh, in the email afterwards. So for the agenda, uh, the first thing we're going to cover is just very high level, a, a state of the subscription world as it is today, followed by how you can optimize your subscription business. Things have changed a lot over the past few years. Uh, so just diving into that a bit. Then we're going to focus on um, growing internationally and how uh, including different payment options and gateways into your international expansion can really help drive growth. And then lastly, from a, a much broader perspective, how can you grow your business uh, when you focus on reducing your churn, cutting your costs, and uh, ultimately boosting your revenue month over month? And um, let's kick it off with the current subscription landscape. So, uh, you know, Jenna, I think everyone's very well aware how subscriptions have changed the way that not only businesses operate, but how as consumers, um, you know, we, we digest things and, and leverage software that's out there. So I did just want to kind of get your take at what you've seen over the past you know, five or seven years um, going from uh, one-off purchases for products and services to now creating that recurring revenue stream and, and just what's changed. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Recurly was uh, founded about a decade ago, so we've seen a lot of changes in the subscription space over the last 10 years. I think the first version of a, script, a subscription, right, was software. Uh, there was a time where if you wanted to buy, you know, some kind of, of software at Best Buy, for example, you'd go in and spend, you know, $500 on a, on a CD or put that in your computer, and that's how you got access to software. And then things changed to where uh, you know, e-commerce became a thing and you were able to then access software via the internet. Um, and that's really right when the first kind of boom in the subscription space happened was when you no longer paid an upfront fee at a store for a product, but now you're paying a monthly subscription to get access to very similar software, which made it easier to buy, right? You could increase conversion because you no longer had to come out of pocket for, you know, $500, let's say, for, for access to Photoshop, right? Now you could pay maybe $39 a month for access to that same software. So that became from a one-time purchase now into a subscription. And now I feel like we see subscriptions everywhere, especially over the past five years, we've seen, um, you know, companies move from one-time purchases, for example, direct-to-consumer products, right? There was a time you could only go into a store, right, and buy your toilet paper and your makeup and other kinds of um, goods, even, even goods you have to replenish on a monthly basis, where now I feel like there's a box of the month, right, for everything these days, from socks to food to dog food. Uh, we power, you know, FabFootFun and, and BarkBox, for example. So we see subscriptions moving into various spaces, but not just e-commerce, right? We now see it even in brick and mortar stores. Um, you know, pre-COVID, Burger King launched a coffee subscription. <laughs> not a, really a place people think to buy coffee, but um, obviously they're trying to drive people back into, you know, the restaurant to buy things. So we've definitely seen a shift from, you know, one-time purchases. Everyone has Amazon Prime envy, right? From, from companies all over the world that say, you know, Amazon Prime is taking a bulk of our business. How do we now go direct to consumer and, and e-commerce via subscriptions, right, is a big part of that. Yeah, and I, I think one thing that jumps out at me that I see on the bottom right there with relationship-based and, and customer-centric, I think that really forced companies to not just make a product and then sell it thinking, you know, this is what's out there, people will buy it, but you have to maintain, you know, a high level of consistency and continually bring the best product, whether it's a, a good or a service to the end customer, because there's always the option of them choosing something else. So um, I, I think really it's benefited businesses with the recurring nature of the revenue and how it's automating everything, but also it's definitely benefited customers as well. And I think that joint um, offering for both customers and businesses has seen a, a huge spike in the amount of, of money that's moving around. So, AG, if I could just go to you and, and maybe you can talk through how this has grown so tremendously over the last few years. 
Yeah, thanks, Michael. Well, when you look at these three different use cases, I mean, you know, Ricardo has been at the forefront of this subscription revolution or recurring payment revolution. And uh, the challenge has been that as so much money has shifted to these models, that's invoicing, subscriptions or installments, the challenge has been that the traditional methods really of collecting money are, are, are falling short of the mark here. And it's causing problems. And we're going to talk a bit more about this later, but essentially, they, they, you look at traditional methods like wire transfer or even checks. So in the US, 52% of B2B transactions are still with checks. Now, it's almost zero in Europe. So you think about that, you, you, you're only offering checks uh, and you get a check from, say, Sydney, Australia. You're not going to be able to cash that in uh, Denver, Colorado. And if, you, if you're invoicing them every month, that's a lot of postage and everything. And anyway, in the year of COVID. But so, so I think we've seen problems with traditional ways like wire transfers, a push mechanism. And then, so the, the, the model that's been adopted is credit cards, but there, there's problems with them because there's high levels of churn. They're very expensive. It gets worse as you go international as well. You get poor failure rates and, and so on. So this, this way that Riccoli has, has been at the forefront of has created these challenges. And, and this, is, this is, you know, the number of this uh, uh, webinar is that, you know, Gokardos uses bank debit globally. And that's based on the idea that organizations, payees, can ask their customers or payers for permission to take regular payments, whatever size, directly from their bank account. And that is, that is the difference that we're looking at. It's, not, it's been used traditionally for like my, my Verizon bill is paid via ACH. ACH is what it's been known. But this enormous wave of recurring billing has caught a lot of people out as they've expanded internationally, especially. So, so it is it is really hitting a lot of businesses now. Yeah, and, and you did mention um, the way that COVID has changed the world dramatically over the last four years. And I think it's a, a poignant observation in that not necessarily being optimi uh, opportunistic, um, with moving away from checks to something like go cardless and bank transfers, but it's really providing a solution for a problem. There aren't people in offices. There's not uh, people aren't going to lock boxes or to banks. So having an alternative that's safe and also uh, more economical, I think it just makes sense. So it's a way to help not only sustain you today, but help build for your future growth. And the next part is actually what we're going to talk about is. Um, you know, how, what levers can you pull to help optimize your business and help you grow? So, you know, there's two parts of the puzzle. I think one of them, subscription and billing platform, is a fairly obvious one if you want to launch or grow a subscription business. Uh, but the other one that typically was thought of as a back office function was payments. And we're seeing that now um, payments are, are deserving of a, a seat at the front office where they can really affect the strategy and overall top line uh, revenue of your business. So, you know, maybe Jenna, just a few words from you on how you've seen uh, the subscription and billing platform specifically at Recurly change over the years to kind of cater to the way that businesses are operating. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, if you are a merchant that's looking to launch a subscri subscription product, right, you realize you, you absolutely need a payment gateway, an acquirer processor. Uh, and then as you start to launch your product, whichever payment gateway you've chosen, you'll quickly realize they probably don't power very robust subscription billing or recurring billing. Um, so if you think about, you know, there's probably over 150 gateways worldwide, many of them have some kind of basic subscription functionality, but it's usually to charge a credit card one time per month for a single plan, right? And so if you have a true subscription product where you have multiple plans, multiple products, you want to give your, your customers options of how they want to buy you, you then need to really engage with a true subscription billing platform like a Recurly, right? And so as you think about just domestic processing, credit cards are fine, right? But then as you start to either dip your toe in the water or even fully launch globally, you start to realize there's, there's more than just credit cards outside the United States, right? So for a US, you a very US-centric company, um, they may not even realize that when they go into Europe and other regions of the world, like Australia, people there don't necessarily 
use credit cards as their first method of payment. So multiple payment methods is definitely something at the forefront of a company looking to go global, uh, especially in the subscription place if you want to make sure you're giving them the best way to pay uh, and, the, and the way that they're used to paying. Another thing to think about too as you go global is thinking about uh, gateway performance, right? Lots of people as they start their companies launch with a single gateway. Um, and if you've ever been with a gateway that's gone down and you didn't have a backup, you very quickly learn how important it is to actually understand the performance of your payment gateway that you choose. And sometimes obviously you don't have control over that in terms of, um, you know, you may think, okay, they had good uptime, they go down. So something we like to, um, you know, consult our merchants are, are, you know, what is their gateway strategy? Do they have more than one payment gateway? Um, and then also better understanding the performance of those gateways. Local tax compliance, I think, is something that most companies don't think of as they expand globally. They just assume, okay, well, you know, I handle tax pretty easily in the U.S., but then that complexity obviously expands as you go into different regions of the world. Um, if you're only processing credit cards, right, currency support, so you may think, okay, we can, I can process in multi, multiple currencies with my gateway. It all settles back to the U.S. dollar. I'm fine. Um, but as you go into various countries, you'll realize that not only does that payment method matter, but then how are you actually, you know, managing the currency support? And this ties into a bullet point, of a few, a few down, which is revenue recognition. How do you want to re recognize revenue in a country, right? So if you're going into Europe, do you actually have a European office? Or are you actually just going to settle that all back to the U.S. dollar, back to a U.S. office? So there are a lot of kind of finance, um, tax, revenue implications when you go global. And then I think, you know, involuntary churn is something in billing that's very important and something at the forefront of our value at Recurly is, you know, involuntary churn ultimately is when a card fails, not when a subscriber cancels, but really when a card fails for some reason and you can't renew a subscription. There are lots of reasons why that happens. And so we've built uh, some machine learning around helping to increase success and decrease involuntary churn. And then the last piece, kind of the theme of, of the whole topic here, right, is removing friction. How do you make sure you increase conversion at checkout? And very often that's making sure that you are accepting the payment method you're consuming consumers used to paying with. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Jenna. And I know we'll dive a bit deeper into some of the topics that you raised. Um, I did mention before that uh, payments has historically been a back office function. In the next slide, we will cover you know, why it deserves a seat at the table um, as a more strategic piece of your business. But uh, uh, you know, I did want to ask you, AG, um, if you see here on the right hand side, there's a number of bullet points there and we'll, we'll dive into some of these in greater detail in the coming slides. But overall, you know, these are some values that you have to look at, at when you're dealing with payments. And what do you think differentiates, you know, some of these with in recurring space versus what used to be the way of doing business? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, as I said before, if you think about the traditional ways that people have tried to collect with wire transfer checks, and then they kind of merge with the e-com world with credit cards. And so for a, for a B2C company, you have to have cards, that's obvious. But quite often, especially in Europe and Australasia, your next best op op option is to add bank debit, direct debit with that country in mind. I once cycled actually from Maastricht in Holland to Cologne in Germany. Now, I'd be impressed if anyone could actually picture that ride, but it's basically going from, from west to east. And within, just as you cross the border, the actual payment profiles of Germany and in the Netherlands are completely different. And if you don't offer bank debit on Germany, 51% of their B2C commerce is bank debit, and you'll miss out on that and there's very little PayPal. Now you go back across into Holland and you'll find 65% is their ideal solution, which is a bank debit solution, and 20% is PayPal. So it's it, the devil's in the detail, but to uh, globally, uh, for B2B, direct debit is the number one preference, uh, bank debit that is. So preference is a big one, and actually Go Cardless is one of our first US customers many years ago was Box. And they, when they expanded into Europe, it was actually their German customers said, we don't want to pay by sending you uh, dollars to your bank account in, in the States. We want to pay in local currency, bank to bank. And that's how they, that's when they first came across Go Cardless and we managed those payments. So, so preference is a big one. We're going to talk about that in a bit more, but as well as, uh, as well as conversion, 
Uh, if you go to uh, like The Economist and or the Financial Times or Time Magazine, you'll see an extra box there, which is for bank debit. Again, it's the preferred payment in B2C worlds at, in some places, but it's definitely the preferred payment method in the B2B world. In fact, in the B2B world, only 5% of all transactions, this is according to Visa, are actually through credit cards. And you'll find a lot of organizations internationally will not have a corporate credit card. And so if that's all you're offering, then you're going to miss out on a lot of business so conversion there. And th these problems are kind of amplified when you have subscriptions is the frequency of collecting is so much greater than a traditional business. And so it could be every week or it could be every month. You're getting these challenges all the time. So things like cash flow start to get impacted as well if you don't have the right payment method. A lot of subscription businesses grow very fast and cash flow becomes a problem as you're funding that growth. And so you've got to look at cash flow and they're much better methods than the, those ones we've mentioned. And I remember getting into trouble once when I was a VP of EMEA for a, a US software company. And as we grew and grew the revenues, I got into trouble with the CFO because our day sales outstanding, that's a measure of your cash flow, get, got worse and worse and worse the more countries we went into and the different kind of cultural differences about how quickly they pay. So we'll talk about that a bit more. But you know, they, they, we, we go into some detail in an IDC report on this uh, as well, which I'll reference a bit later. But definitely, this, it's, this, the way to optimize is to think of your payment system in, in lockstep with your, your billing system. And, and that's, the, that's the beauty of the, uh, what Recurly and GoCardless have done. You actually don't leave Recurly when you implement GoCardless. You stay in Recurly and you take advantage of all the fantastic functionality they have, and then you layer in the functionality that we have to optimize your payments. Thanks for that, AG. And I think, you know, there's eight different um, value propositions or focal points that are listed there on the right-hand side. You, you can, you know, as we dive into them, I think everyone will be able to see how, you know, every business is different and there may be uh, certain aspects that are more or less of a pain point, which, uh, you know, implementing payments can really help address. And I think leveraging payments uh, within the subscription world, it really can help your business quite tremendously. So AG, I'll stay with you on this one. Um, maybe you can kind of give your take on on why payments were the missing piece and maybe there were some myths out there and what, what the actualities of the world uh, today are. Yeah, so a lot of people have come to the the subscription world from one of those, you know, either the traditional send them an invoice, expect a check, or expect, expect them to wire transfer, or they've come from looking at it from an e-commerce lens, one soft purchases, credit card works fantastically for that. So they think they don't really care because if they offer both of those worlds, they've got it all covered. But customers do care. And the preference uh, report from uh, YouGov, uh, back end of last year, showed that I say five of the nine biggest economies in Europe and the US, North America rather, they prefer this. Now, the US prefers corporate cards still, but but bank debit is actually number two for business to business payments. So that's the first thing. C customers do care, and that will impact your conversion. Uh, it will impact your churn. So you you know you do need to give the customers the options, and in the B two C world, it's another option. You can put a wallet there as an option, or you can put bank debit there as an option, as I've uh, alluded to earlier. Um, they're a back office function in the sense in it, what we're talking about here. We're an API into Recurly, so we're right. We sit right in Recurly. So and you know we're we're supporting the payments is supporting all the fantastic functionality they have to support all the businesses they support, and. Then some people think of it, okay, well, it's, is, it, is it expensive? Well, is it just, you know, transaction fees, are they, are they, are they going to be expensive? Well, the strange thing is uh, using bank debit globally is actually cheaper than credit cards. And, and the, the great thing about being the back-end system to Recurly is that when we're collecting the money, because we stick an authorization on the end customer's account, the reconciliation is automatic. So the kind of labor costs, the efficiency gains, and the RIDC report goes through this in some detail, whole teams get a 20% uh, uh, efficiency bonus by just implementing this kind of payment system. And that was a survey of 10 of uh, GoCardless's customers, including uh, these are all subscription businesses. So these are, you can sleepwalk into making the decisions to collect the money from the traditional world or from the you know, B2C econ world, but 
but you'd be missing out on on optimizing for the subscription world. Thank you for that, AG. So, um, Jenna, you'd mentioned uh, growing internationally, and the next section we're just going to cover off really quickly. And so, I've highlighted here a few of the topics from both sides on subscription and billing platform and the recurring payment solution and how they kind of tie into growing at, uh, internationally. And the first one there um, on the right hand side was payment preference. Um, so, AG, you'd mentioned a, a study we'd done with YouGov, and uh, I think the results are you know, as an American, uh, almost shocking the first time I saw them, but the more I dove into it, the more sense it made. So what, what's your take on this? Well, actually, the, I mean, if you look at the US numbers, which I've also got here as well, I mean, bank debit is preferred or used by 38% of US businesses. So, uh, but this is just the payment method that has been, you know, traditionally used. Traditional direct debit, if you like, is the forerunner to subscription. This is like your utility bill, your gym membership, and we're quite familiar with using uh, bank debit for that. Uh, and, and, you know, as the proliferation of subscription business around the world uh, and, and, and the growth of those, this is just a payment method that was used for that traditionally. And it's still preferred in a lot of these places. Now in the B2B world, this, these are B2B preferences here. It is fundamentally more preferred. We haven't got the German flag on there, which is a shame because it's over 60%. And as I mentioned before, Box, they got told by their German customers, you must provide us with this facility because this is the way we want to pay. You think about the benefits to the end customer of their accounts payable teams. It's automated. You don't have to do a, a wire transfer, do the, the foreign exchange and all that the, all that stuff. Uh, and so, so it is it is a much more efficient way and it is preferred. And like I say, it's number two in the US and actually number two in Canada as well, uh, bank debit. But corporate cards are, are still proliferating in those markets for sure. Thank you, AG. Um, the next next piece we'll dive into right here is uh, coverage and conversion. And um, you know, coverage that would be offering the payments uh, as broadly as you can. Uh, with Go Cardless, for example, we cover 72% of all payment volumes that are transacting uh, in the world through the coverage that we have. And then conversion uh, that is, you know, getting the customer to move forward. Um, the, the the way I look at that is, you know. In my personal life, uh, I typically carry a credit card in my wallet, and if I'm walking down the street and I pop into a corner store and it has a sign that says cash only, well, uh, typically I'm not going to have cash on me and, and I won't buy anything there. So it, it affects the conversion. That, that can be an analogy for you know, what we're dealing with in the subscription world. So Jenna, um, how do you see you know, offering the payments as broadly as possible and then uh, implementing something that leads to a higher conversion. How can that affect uh, subscription businesses? We've seen some of our largest customers go global, right? They start in the U.S. predominantly, and like I said before, credit cards have been fine. And then as they start to process payments outside the U.S., they realize there's this concept of, of kind of increased declines when you don't process either with a local payment method or with a local processor, right? And they don't know this until they actually go global. And so the great thing about our partnership with GoCardless and a big part of the reason of why we decided to partner with GoCardless was around, you know, helping even some of our largest merchants who are some of the largest, um, you know, platforms in the world figure out a way to make sure, number one, are they, you know, able to support the right payments in the regions they want to go into? And very often, right, Europe um, is typically the first region you expand into as a US-based company, right? There is a less of a language barrier, the culture is very similar. So Europe we see is a very, uh, is usually that first kind of entry into international. And uh, like I said, credit cards, sure, that could be fine for a short period of time. But what we've realized is that as merchants uh, get smart within the, those regions, right, they know that they have accept the local payment method that those consumers want to buy in and that not only is it about conversion and making sure that they have the payment method uh, available to them when they check out but on top of that is also this concept of increased conversion um, as, uh, in terms of um, authorizations as well to make sure that transaction will actually successfully process thanks for that Jenna and we, we just covered um, you know specifically growing international but that, that really shouldn't be your only focus if you're a business. So what are some other ways just all told that you can um, really affect change in your business? And, and three key ones are reducing your churn, 
uh, cutting costs and boosting revenue, which is what I want to chat through a little bit um, here. So AG, um, you know, we've talked a lot about cards and we've compared them to bank debit. With regards to uh, you know payment success or reducing payment failures, can you talk through that a bit? Yeah, so I mean, I I don't know about you. I, I've I've had the same bank uh, since 1982. It tells you how old I am. Uh, you can't see me, uh, but I'm really old. Uh, so uh, you know that's not changed. That number's not changed. So uh, and that's where that that's the pot of last reserve where my money's going to be. And so when you look on the left here, you see the ways, the many ways that credit cards can fail. And there's obviously high fraud. Uh, I've been a victim of uh, mistaken identity uh, before. Well, not mistaken, somebody stole my identity and spent some money. Uh, I think lots of people have got that. You lose credit cards, you run out of credit on them, you change them, so the numbers change and, and so on. So there's a lot of areas where they fail. And typically, and then, you know, insufficient funds, you run out of credit. That's, a, you know, it's tough at the moment for so many people as well. So there's a high failure rate for cards. There's a very low failure rate for bank debit. It, it's a fraction of uh, credit cards. And it's normally insufficient funds because, you know, that's, but that's usually the pot where the last amount of money you have is. And people keep the same bank account. And so one of the problems when you get a failure with cards you wake up a sleeper because you chase them for, uh, and they need to put in a new card. And a lot of organizations then lose that customer. And so that, that failure then becomes a churn. And we think, and we've seen from ProfitWell, uh, there's, there's a great webinar they're running uh, about two hours later today, by the way. They look at all of these, uh, this analysis and 20 to 40% of all churn is through payment failures and credit cards failure, they fail a lot more. Thanks for that, AG. Yeah, and just you know, talking about churn, um, Jenna, I know Recurly uh, is really an expert in the industry uh, with churn. So I, I would love for you to kind of give some background and, and maybe talk about what the difference is between voluntary and involuntary churn and why involuntary churn is something that you can really tackle with the right payment method or tools. Sure, absolutely. So churn ultimately is, you know, the rate at which a company loses subscribers due to subscription cancellations. Uh, and like you just said, there are two types of churn. One is voluntary. That's when someone says, you know, I'm not really watching Netflix. That's not really a true thing for any of us. But let's say you said, I'm not watching Netflix and you decide to, you know, log in, cancel your subscription, you no longer want to purchase that service, right? So that's voluntary. You're actually choosing to not use it anymore. And then the second type of churn, um, which is a lot harder to manage, right? A voluntary churn, you could potentially provide them with um, a coupon or ask them why they're leaving, right? Offer them options to stay. Involuntary churn, you have less of a pre present an option to actually make, help that transaction go through. Involuntary churn ultimately is when a card is failing for various number of reasons, and they are you are ba they're basically unintentionally not uh, able to charge that transaction. Um, so involuntary churn over 10 years of being in business, right? We found lots of reasons why cards fail. Anything from, um, you know, in the credit card world, a card expiring to, um, you know, maybe insufficient funds, right? If it's tied to someone's debit account or checking account. Uh, so, and then also on top of that is if it's an international transaction, right? It's possible that the issuing bank could think it's fraud which could also ca cause the card to decline. And so we built machine learning to ultimately help increase uh, the chance that a card will uh, actually be successful. And so we, if, if we get a decline, we will retry the card in an intelligent way to increase the chance that card will go through. And so the, you know, the great thing about using alternative payment methods, especially when they're local payment methods, is decreasing the chance that that churn will occur. Right. So if you use a credit card in a region, for example, it may fail because the credit card issuer may think it's fraud. Whereas if you're using a local payment method, that card may actually go through. Um, so using the right payment methods is definitely part of that equation of decreasing involuntary churn. And, you know, usually if you're a subscription company, you're not going to have access to the ability to programmatically, like you do with Recurly, manage involuntary churn. It's a technology you'd have to build internally. It's very complex. We've actually seen companies who've built internal subscription tech 
maybe five, 10 years ago, circle back and call Recurly and say, hey, we, we, we thought we built something to manage involuntary churn, but we realized it's really complicated and hard to manage, and they end up becoming a customer after all. Yeah, and I, th I think it is interesting and worth calling out. You know, this section was, uh, it's about growth. And uh, here you're talking about keep, keeping customers and how do you connect the dots to growth? Uh, let's say you have 1,000 customers and you have a sales team and uh, they go out and they bring on 50 new customers, which is great. Well, if you have a high involuntary churn rate and you lose 50 customers at the same time your sales team's bringing on 50 new ones, you're still stuck at a thousand customers, so there's no growth there. But if you That's reduce right. your involuntary churn uh, and you stay, let's say at a thousand, then you add those 50 customers, now you see the growth. And that's part of how you know I see as payments remove themselves as a back office function and they really can become a strategic part of your business. And when you take churn and you uh, lower it, and when you increase your conversion, uh, this can really uh, help your business, but you have to think about lowering your overall costs um and you know ag what, what ways do payments affect cost uh but you know i know fees but what else is out there well when you think about a b2b business for instance um if you're going to expand internationally and you've got to cater to the preferences of say what they how they want to pay in france or new zealand for instance then you're going to have to set up a bank in that country to be able to invoice them in euros or new zealand dollars for instance so there's a lot of hidden costs like that Somebody in the organization, the CEO or the CFO has got to put their name on that bank registration. They've got to incorporate in that country. And they've also then got to get regulated by those countries' data protection laws and things like GDPR and so on. So it's there's a lot of hidden costs there. Just lawyers' fees is going to cost a lot when you try and expand that way. The alternative then is to ask, you know, send an invoice in dollars and ask them to wire it, but that's expensive. You've got FX fees. They will not be optimized. And you'll get churn because the customers won't like to do that, and you'll get cash flow problems. So, so you know, overall, we've seen when customers, one of our customers, DocuSign, when they added this to the mix, when they just added debit, direct debit to the mix, within six months, 11% of all of their purchases chose that as a preference. So that's white space, we think, and their conversion rate was 12% higher as well. So you know, it it it, it doesn't just increase conversion, no churn the costs are lower as well, because we do that, and we'll do the FX, all for less than the cost of credit cards. And when you add up the size of the collections teams, the risk you're taking when you're setting up banking relationships, and just the pain and uh, opportunity cost of that, overall, uh, doing it this way globally is going to lower your total costs. Great. Thank you, AG. Um, you know, so let's say you're, you're taking all these steps, you're growing your business, uh, people are are buying your and, and signing up for your subscription. Uh, you need to get your money. Um, so Jenna, you know, AG to both of you guys, uh, this is pretty stunning. The amount of time that certain payment gateways and uh, methods can take for the the cash to get in hand for your business. Um, how do you foresee, you know, especially in the world of coronavirus, when when cash is tight, how do you see this affecting businesses? And Jenna, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, for companies that are are probably running pretty slim, whether they're funded or not funded, right, uh, you know, getting your money as soon as possible is really important. Um, you know, especially if they're used to maybe, you know, processing credit cards, they're used to getting that money relatively quickly so that when they transfer into an alternative form of payment, waiting so long, I mean, 23 days, right, that's a long time to wait, um, is then kind of shocking to them, right? And, and in a way almost makes them think, well, do I really wanna accept payment in this way? So having a gold cardless option where you are basically funding them as quickly as a credit card uh, is, is a pretty awesome solution to have. Yeah, so as well, Michael, just to explain this slide, these are, these are measures of day sales outstanding. I know this customer, um, they're, in the, uh, they're out of Boston. Uh, we haven't got their logo on there. Maybe they've not allowed us to use it. But this, about 60% of their business is US. Uh, and these are the number of days it takes to collect by the different methods they've got there. Day sales outstanding. So fundamentally, what this integration, Recurly and GoCardless, allows organizations to do, and this is particularly prevalent for B2B organizations, it turns a 
push payment, i.e. waiting for a check, waiting for the wire transfer, it turns into a pull payment. And this is the world, we're the world's first global bank to bank pull mechanism. And so on the due date, we will pull the money and the money comes out of their accounts. We do the FX and then it lands in the customer's accounts in dollars if that's their preference. We can do it the other way around. We can pull out of in, in uh, Canadian dollars and land it in euros in France, for instance. So, so but the, this, is, this is the fundamental difference. We we pull the money. So when you when your trip advisor, this is a terrible example, but I, it was at the top of my mind because I was thinking of uh, Massachusetts, where trip advisor headquarters. This is not trip advisor's numbers, by the way, but the way that they collect all those micro commissions of all those hotels. You know, when you click on a hotel, when you go to trip advisor and you look at a review, or you click to book a, uh, a restaurant, they own most of those restaurant booking. This 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 analogy, this metaphor is getting worse now in the current environment, but you can understand that generates a lot of it's a subscription kind of regular recurring billing that they're sending out to all these hotels all these restaurants they collect all that with bank debit with go cardless and then they collect it all and then they land it all in their dollars in their in boston that's how that works this is why you imagine trying to chase down 30,000 hotels for micro payments that's why this method works because not those, those, they don't all use a corporate card and a lot of them wouldn't use a corporate card and you cannot cash a check from Italy in Boston that easily either. So, so it transforms the world of, you know, recurring billing at scale internationally because you are pulling the money out of your end customers accounts rather than waiting for them to send it to you. Thanks for that, AG. And I think the, you know, this presentation so far has really done a great job of um, you know, walking through what having the right subscription and billing platform paired with the right recurring payment method can um, can do for a business. And so thank you, Jenna. Thank you, AG, for, you know, walking through that and giving us your insights. Um, there's a few questions I have here uh, for you. So um, AG, the, the first one is, what has prompted GoCardless and Recurly to work together? And why is the partnership such a good pairing? Uh, well, what's prompted is because they've been at the forefront of subscriptions we currently have for along for 10 years. Uh, and so it, it's just the most obvious and neatest solutions to integrate into that, that background because there's the, 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 the use case is the same. We, we're absolutely, absolutely a synergistic in the offer with, with Recurly. Uh, and so you know, the, the customer never leaves Recurly when they've got Go Cardless. Uh, but you know we're giving them an option there of how to pull the payment. So it's it's a it, it's because our use case is so slim. We're all about recurring billing subscription companies, and also you know the two companies work well together. And, and I, I, I did actually steal one of the recurly engineers across to uh, go cardless as well. I shouldn't perhaps mention that, but that helps as well. Thanks, thanks for that, AG. And I, I've had the pleasure of working with the recurly team since we've started this relationship back in November. And uh, you know, I'm super excited for uh, all the things we've done and are going to do. Um, Jenna, another question here. So in addition to the value outlined during the session around how payments can strategically affect the front office of a subscription business, how else do you think the right subscription and billing platform paired with the right payment solution can impact the business? You know, I think something people don't necessarily think about as they're building out payments, right, is like how how do you grow your technology, your support for certain things without doing too much development work, right? That's something that um, I think is usually seen in hindsight. Um, you know, a lot of developers make uh, some payments decisions. Maybe they don't necessarily have payments expertise, but they're the ones who might be tasked with choosing a payment provider. And often they're... Uh, you know, their decision-making process can be about around just build, building around the easiest tech, right? And they don't necessarily go super deep on, you know, what does my business look like in 10 years? And it could be that they just don't have visibility into that. So I think, you know, making sure that when, you, when you're making a choice in terms of your both your billing provider as well as your payment processor, payment, you know, partner is around, you know, what happens as I grow, right? You have to think about cost. Are they going to be flexible with me as I grow from a cost and rate perspective? And then on top of that, what does it actually take to maintain this integration? Um, you know, is it easy for me to add payment methods, add gateways? Uh, something great about the Recurly solution in particular is that, you know, we power a very large number of gateway connections, which means that 
um, we, we take out the obscurity of having to do lots of integrations to different providers. So if you're processing credit cards today with you know, one of the bigger providers out there and you say, I really need to add alternative payment methods, now you can easily right, plug in, basically go cardless. Um, that integration is super easy and fast. You ultimately just plug in your, your credentials of go cardless into Recurly and you don't have to do an integration, another integration. You don't have to convince your dev team to do any work. So I think you know, maintenance, development effort, costs moving forward are all kind of pieces of the equation that have to be considered when you're when you're considering your technical stack. Thank, thanks for that, Jenna. Um, AG, one more question for you here. Um, you know, people have heard of ACH in the US and other bank-to-bank -bank payment networks. Uh, what is it that makes GoCardless different? Yeah, so uh, great question. Well, uh, ACH has been around for a long time and every single country has got its own version of ACH. Okay, so I mean, what GoCardless has essentially done, we've abstracted all of that complexity into a single platform and uh, taken out all the pains of getting integrated. We also then take away the problems of complying with all the local regulations and laws. We make sure things like the checkout screens will comply to German data protection laws, for instance. And so that, that, that kind of abstracting all the complexity into a single platform, but it's not just the US, it's global. And then we're layering in, or we layered in already, and we're layering in value add services on top. For instance, just, just launched Success Plus, which is similar to Recurly's uh, intelligent retries. We do a very similar thing across the globe as well and so we're just offering all of that functionality and then adding some more value on top for recurring billing as well so that's the difference it's one integration into recurly in fact it's already there so that's the other advantage you don't have to try and negotiate with multiple countries banks to get access to their network we've done all that we're regulated like a bank in all those countries and we we help you comply we're a controller so we help you comply in all those other countries as well so you got no, you know you can sleep at night with go colors because we're worrying and we're on the hook for gdpr for you and it's all through one sim simple integration into recurly so you don't have to learn anything new and i was just checking there was a quote from one of our joint customers saying it basically took him a matter of, said it took me a matter of hours to get wow. up and running a matter of hours and so that's that's how easy it is uh, as well that's different to any other way of trying to do this and it's not just ach it's 72% of the global uh, commerce that we're covering. Well, thank, thank you so much for that, AG. One last question here for you, Jenna. Um, and you know, I've, uh, I mentioned before, we've been working together since November, and I've seen the great strides that, that you've taken in really serving your customers as they look to grow internationally. Um, what, what is Recurly's plan to really uh, help with that initiative, to help companies expand and grow internationally? Sure. I mean, I think the biggest part, right, is making sure that our uh, support for the most number of international currencies that we're seeing our merchants needing is probably top of mind for us, right? We want to make sure that if a merchant's moving into a certain region, that we don't have to say to them, oh, sorry, we don't support that region, uh, that we have a partner just like Cardless that we can say, sure, we support that alternative payment method and, and help them really, like AG said, get up and running potentially in, in, in a few short short weeks if that's what they need to do. So I think just making sure we have the best global coverage for our merchants is something that we care about. And also making sure that early in conversations with our merchants, because some of them come to us either with existing volumes, some come to us brand new, um, is making sure that we have the right partners to help consult them through that process, right? Often merchants, especially if they're mostly based in the United States, they don't know what they don't know. So often they don't know what questions should we actually be asking around international expansion? So also offering that consultative um, conversation to our merchants is important to us as well. Thank you, Jenna. I appreciate it. And uh, to Jenna and AG, both of you, thank you guys so much. This was uh, incredibly insightful and uh, hopefully helpful to those of you who have decided to join. Um, if you do have, uh, for anyone on the line, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to reach out with the contact information on the screen. And thanks so much for attending. Hope everyone has a great day.